There's so many companies out there doing it and some are pretty big name companies. And I bet I've had at least three people who have come to me who were trained by them and they're trained completely wrong. This is Med Spa Mayhem, the podcast all about the chaotic world of medical aesthetics. From Botox to lasers to IV bars, Learn how to tell real versus fake, legal versus illegal, and safe versus potentially deadly. Hear the crazy stories inside the med spa world and find out what questions to ask and how to spot the people cutting corners. I'm your host, Dr. Kate D. Together we explore the wild west of medicine that is the aesthetics industry. Hi, this is Dr. Kate D, and I am here today with Dr. Kristen Jacobs. Kristen is a aesthetic medicine doctor in Glen Carbon, Illinois. She's been doing that for, I believe, 16 years, since 2008. She's a graduate of Ross University School of Medicine, followed by a family medicine residency at Southern Illinois University. Uh, thanks so much for being here, Kristen. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. So in addition to your aesthetic practice, you also are a teacher of aesthetics. Is that right? I am. I, I have been a trainer for Allergan for over 10 years. And then last year, I actually opened up my own aesthetic academy. So I call it the Aesthetic Resource and Training or Art Academy. And I have been having so much fun training others on how to inject. It's been really incredible. That's so great. So I really appreciate having physician trainers. It makes such a big difference in the the level of skill and, and training. Can you tell us your story, just how you got into aesthetics and what what triggered that? So it is actually a pretty funny story because I had my two babies and I started looking in the mirror and wondering who the heck was staring back at me. At that time, I was in family medicine. We had our own practice. My husband's a chiropractor, so we had our own family medicine chiropractic wellness center. And we were in a very small town, about an hour from where I am now. And we had these two babies. And I remember, I remember this was 2008, so 16 years ago. The internet wasn't as popular back then. I hate to even say that, showing our age. But I remember calling my friend and saying, hey, I've heard of this thing called Botox. I remember in residency, I, I saw it when I was in doing my ophthalmology rotation. And I really think I want to do it. Like, I, I don't, I, I've got these lines and wrinkles that I really want. So my friend's like, yeah, let's do it. And at that point, I, how do you even find out? Again, 2008, how do you even find out where you go, who's reputable, what's happening? And again, we were in a small town. So we did a ton of research and I ended up, my, my best friend said to me, you do a wellness clinic. Why don't you add this to your clinic? And I thought, mess with other people's faces? How is this even going to work out for me? And she convinced me to try it. So I went and did a training with a doctor up in Milwaukee. And I tell you what, it's, I thought, there's no way I'm doing filler. I'll do Botox all day long, but filler, it was very scary to me. I wasn't really a procedure type of gal when I was in uh, family medicine residency. And when I got that filler syringe in my hand, I just knew this is what I was supposed to do. And I mm -hmm. feel so blessed that my best friend said to me, you know, told me to do this. And really, that's all she wrote. So when I moved over here, we moved over to this area when my oldest was starting kindergarten and I started just doing a little here and there. And then we opened up our clinic that we currently have. We've been in our building 12 years this month, actually. So I was doing family medicine and aesthetics at the same time. And then I took the leap after three years of really working on aesthetics and went a hundred percent aesthetics. So I, I actually wrote a book about all of this in my journey and in the journey of, of my patients. And it's, it's been a fun ride, that's for sure. 
I feel very blessed to be in the aesthetic industry. And that's very early, honestly, for aesthetics. So you can date the birth of the aesthetics industry probably to when Botox was approved for cosmetic use, which was 2003. So, Uh I mean, that was really very soon after that. Botox and filler have only been around that long. So I know, you know, that you're crazy? kind of not a, not a hundred percent OG, but you're close. What's I'm the close. name of your book? Can you audience? It's, sure, it's called "Live Life Beautifully with a Little Help," and that's my <laughs> motto. Yep, that's, that's great. my motto. So, so I was hoping that we could talk about how to choose an aesthetic provider because I know that's a passion of yours, and I think that has been a major theme throughout this podcast is how to choose the right provider, what to look for, what questions to ask. So can you give us kind of your overview and then we can dive in? Yes. I think this is a very frustrating topic because most people who aren't educated in aesthetics and really aren't educated in how it is a medical procedure really choose a provider by how much it costs. And that is the last thing that anybody should be choosing a provider from. So I always, I always ask my patients, well, how did you hear about me? And the main thing that they say is they look at our reviews and we have really good reviews, which we can get into that in a minute. But the other thing is they, they look at my experience. And of course we have photos on our website as well. So so they, they, they start diving in and they see that I've been doing this since 2008. They see that I'm a trainer. They see that I, I teach others how to do it. And I really feel like you don't have to be a trainer by any means to be the right provider. But I do feel like those of us who do the extra, go the extra mile, do the podcast, that is education, that is training. Those that educate the, the public um, are the ones that we, that the patient should be choosing. So it happens with the very first touch point. So social media, um, when, when you're looking for a provider. So you're looking at the social media, you're making sure that um, the photos, the before and after photos are really standard and accurate. And then if you wanna give the office a call, how are you treated on the phone? Does the front desk person know any kind of answers that you're asking? And not just about price, I mean about the services you're asking about. So again, it goes back to that education. And I think instead of basing everything on price, because that's inappropriate, making sure that you're getting educated. And then I say even one step further, if you feel comfortable after a phone call, if a patient feels comfortable, and they go into the clinic, make sure the clinic is clean, Make sure that they're happy and they relate to the provider or the person giving the consultation. I think there's just so much to deciding on the right provider. And I always tell people, if you're not comfortable, walk out. It doesn't matter. Don't pay anything. Just walk out. And those that are doing it out of their house, ugh, that just... (laughs) Well, don't do that. Yeah. I, I think that... So there are so many points here. I think the number one thing, the first thing we should talk about is why price does not determine why you should go to someplace. This has come up a few times on the podcast about people trying to undercut, but the people trying to undercut are oftentimes using fake product. They don't have the proper certifications. They're not paying for insurance. There are a lot of reasons why a product or a service would be really cheap. And chances are that makes it way more dangerous. And it's really hard to convince people they should pay more for something. Oh, isn't it the same? The the answer is it is absolutely not the same. And, and so do you have anything to add to that? Because it's, it's, we have talked about fake product. We've talked about people who are not licensed. We've talked about people who are cutting quarters in various ways to make things cheaper, but all of those things actually endanger patients undergoing that service. Right. I agree 100%. And even if the product is the same, if they don't have the right training, it's like you said, it's dangerous. And one of the things that I pride myself on is I'm not perfect. And not every treatment comes out exactly how maybe I want it to come out. But one of the things that I always do is we do follow-ups. 
and we make sure the patient is happy and we want to make sure that they got the right treatment, enough of the product placed in the right place. And I think that these fly by night places that could be using fake product, or like I said, even if they're using real product, they're still not trained the right way. But even more, these clinics are not trained if something goes wrong. And this to me is, yeah. is terrifying. And so Botox or, or neuromodulators, there's not a whole lot technically that can go wrong. But when we get into fillers, it's dangerous. And there are people yeah. doing it out of their house. And do they have hyaluronidase? Do they, do they even know that there could be a vascular occlusion? Do they even know this? Are they talking to patients? I actually had a patient the other day come in and she is a, works at a front desk at a salon. And she said, people come in there. I didn't ask any questions, but she said, people come in there and inject and they do filler in there. And she said, Ew. I am so happy I'm here. You guys took my photos. You had me sign a consent. They didn't sign consents at the salon. She said, you went through That's scary. everything. It is scary. Every single thing that could go wrong, you went through it with me. And I feel very confident that if something does, God forbid, that you'll be able to take care of it. Right. I, I think it's really important. You have to be able to treat your own complications. And even Absolutely. physicians who are out of their league, they don't really know what they're doing. They may not know how to treat a complication as well. I mean, you have to make sure people know what they're doing. I interviewed a, a woman uh, recently on the podcast who went to an ENT who just didn't think an occlusion could happen to him. And he also used a non-dissolvable filler. And he was not prepared to treat this massive occlusion that he caused. I mean, it's 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 horrible. He also didn't properly consent her. So I think that when you look at it in terms of price and you think, well, I'll probably get away with it, that is probably true. So you you will probably get away with it. But if you are one of the people who has a complication and there's plenty of those people walking around then you are hosed if you go to one of these places, totally hosed. You really are. And I'm actually yeah. speaking in a couple of weeks at the aesthetic show about filler complications. And knock on wood, fortunately, I, I've had one in 16 years, one vascular occlusion. And it was just in the fall. So it was 15 years in. And I had all my protocols. I'd never done it, but I had all my protocols and it was all written out and we followed it. She's totally fine. But it's scary. And it's so funny because another patient yesterday, I would, I tell everybody, I'm like, because everybody asks, like, how many have you had and how common is this? And so prior to that one, I was like, please don't ask me. Like, it's, it's, it's very rare, but it can happen to anybody. And it's not really an if, it's a when. And that's what my talk is all about is it's not an if, it's a when. It's going to happen. So you need to learn how to treat it. So anyway, she said, I told him, I said, I had one and it was just recently. It happened to be her friend. And so she texted her friend and she said, hey, did you have a, a vascular occlusion at, you know, Dr. Jacob's office? And so the text back was so freaking funny. She said, oh, my gosh, she did such an amazing job. I would put my life in her hands and I just love <laughs> her. And so I just felt so good about that. And that's that's what we need. We all need to be educated. And it's again, it's not an if it's a when. And so if you want as a patient, if you want to take that chance and go into a clinic that's cheaper, it's it's just scary to me. It's just scary. What do you think about these unlicensed providers, especially estheticians doing weekend courses and then going to, into business on their own? This has come up a few times. They can order like a Hyaluron pen off of the internet and offer needleless filler. Someone asked me about this recently and and I'm like, Oh my God, that's the scariest thing I can think of. But what what do you think about that? Have you seen that in your area? Because this has been yeah. a lot more common lately. Yeah. I, I feel my blood pressure just rising talking about this. <laughs> so in the in the state of Illinois, estheticians technically cannot inject, but in the state of Missouri, they can. Now, how scary oh my is goodness, that? Really? So an esthetician, yeah. yeah. So the thing that I'm seeing in Well, and before one, you go on, yeah, just so yeah. our listeners understand. They can only under a doctor's supervision. Yes. They cannot do that independently. And so a doctor has to be supervising them and guaranteeing that they're trained properly and they're doing it safely. 
And unfortunately, in these states where this is the case, estheticians don't know it and they don't care and they are just setting up shop on their own and they're not being supervised. So just keep that in mind. If you are going to somebody who's an esthetician and you think that's legal, just make sure that they're actually being supervised by a doctor. And let's even back up just one more step. What is an esthetician? An esthetician, yeah. from what I understand, it's maybe, I don't even know what the, I, I quite honestly don't know how long it takes to become one, but there's no medical classes or anything in that. Yeah, there? there's no medical training for estheticians. I actually just interviewed an esthetician for this podcast. She is a teacher now. Apparently, at least in California, even though California is very stickler about its rules about education and training, they've reduced the requirements. So I believe it's 300 hours of didactic and I believe 300 hours of practical training. And they do have a test that's on a computer. There's no longer a practical test in California. I'm sure there's still a practical test in many states, but there's no medical training whatsoever. I think the thing to understand is that estheticians do not learn about bacteria and bacterial infections. They don't learn about sterile technique or sterility. They learn about cleanliness, right? And they learn about sterilizing equipment, but they don't learn about sterile human procedures, which is one of these very, very critical things that you learn if you're a nurse or a doctor. It's just critically important in any kind of medical treatment that you're going to do. Right. And you mentioned nurses, so let's go there. In the state of Illinois, an RN cannot own their own practice. But a nurse practitioner who has, I believe it's 4,000 hours can apply for, oh, I forget the term, the term, and they can own their yes, own practice. Yes, it's an independent nursing practice. Yeah. And so what I'm seeing though, is I'm seeing nurses pop up all over the place with their owning their own clinic. And there's one nurse practitioner who has, is supervising multiple clinics in Missouri and multiple clinics in Illinois. Now, I I just don't even understand how this is legal. I don't understand I, how a nurse practitioner who is not in the office can be the supervising physician. As, as a physician in Illinois, I have to sign off on every single chart of the nurses, of estheticians, of laser technicians. Yeah. And so this is this is what's happening. And to me, this is scary because if you're not following the laws, then how are you doing the right things for what you're supposed to be doing in the aesthetic world? That That's my opinion. Are you doing the good faith uh, exam or are you really following what you're supposed to be doing? And I, I just don't believe that they are. That's that's my opinion. I I personally, it's my practice as a medical director, I feel very strongly that I have to have a presence there and monitor and check in with every single person who works under me. But I personally don't think it's possible to have the kind of proper supervision over multiple offices, much less some of these places are three, four, five, up to 10, 12. I've heard people monitoring 12 offices. It's just not humanly possible. No. And so I think what these people are doing is just renting out their license so that other people can practice medicine illegally because right. they're basically practicing without a license and they're borrowing this nurse practitioner's license in order right. to get the Botox and try to appear legitimate on paper, even though probably they're not. Right. And and to me, it's like you just said, too. It's one, I value my license. And two, I value the relationship I have with my patients. And three, I want to do what's best for everybody. And I am just like you. My home is five minutes from my office. I'm on site when I have to be. I'm in clinic and I, I still see patients a good three days a week, which I love. But I follow the rules. I want to make sure we follow the rules. And I think that that's super important. So let's go back to what you had asked is when, what do you look for when you're looking for a provider? I think this is a question that they should ask is if they're a nurse, if they're a nurse practitioner, who's supervising you? How often do they come to clinic? 
you know, the, the nurse or nurse practitioner might get upset about it, but quite honestly, they shouldn't. They should say, oh my gosh, I have Dr. So-and-so and Dr. So-and-so is here all the time and I feel so comfortable that I can call them at any time or what whoever right. is supervising. But but you're absolutely right that these doctors or nurse practitioners are just saying, hey, here's my license, go for it. And I, I don't think it's appropriate. Always recommend asking who the medical director is mm -hmm. and then seeing if you get an appointment with the medical director for a consultation, right? I'm booked out kind of far, but you can get an appointment with me, <laughs> okay? And if they don't have a medical director who's actually there, you won't be able to book an appointment with them. Even three months from now, you won't be able to because they're not actually there. I think that's one way of telling whether the medical director actually participates in it. The I other thing is that, amazing. yeah, and, and if, yeah. if an RN, so RNs know they're not allowed to practice medicine and they're not allowed to practice independently. That's in no state is that legal. So if an RN gets defensive about that, then they're essentially lying to you because they're practicing out of the scope of their license. Most right. RNs who own it, who like, I'm proud to be an RN. This is who I am. I'm really good at what I do. And I do it within the confines of my licensure. That's important to me. So if an RN is getting all defensive, well, I don't need that. I've been doing this for 15 years. Why do I need an MD to supervise me? They're basically way ahead of their skis. Okay. So, so I would basically stay away from that person because that person's not really telling you the truth. Right. And I think it is important exactly like you, you have said is that there are nurses and nurse practitioners and and other providers out there that are following the rules. So we're not sitting Absolutely. here just bashing everybody. No, That's no, not what they're, we're doing. they're we're really fantastic. Yeah, they're Absolutely. really well-trained, fantastic RNs, PAs, yes. NPs out there. They're very safe. They're fantastic injectors. They're doing it legally and properly. But it's really important to always have backup, always have someone to turn to like, all right, this is happening. What do I need to do? Can I right. get some advice here? This is what I'm doing. It's really, really helpful to be part of that clinical team. And if you don't have that, then you're sort of out on your own. And if, if you get to the limit of your knowledge and experience, you're not going to be able to, to treat that person properly, right? So I think all of us, like we exist in this team, and I think that's really, really important to be collaborative and supportive of each other. I'm not out there kind of nurse bashing at all. Right. What I'm trying to do is point out the people who are operating illegally and on the fringes or just completely unlicensed comp entirely who are just outside the system. I think the worst outcomes of all are these illegal people who have no business doing this. They're practicing medicine without a license, which is a felony to start with, even if they don't hurt anyone. But meanwhile, they're importing fake product. Right. They're using things that are contaminated, things that are not stored properly. They're hanging things in IV bags that kill people. So these are really, really important issues for people to be aware before they, you know, pick a provider. So absolutely. number one thing is absolutely don't go to someone who's operating illegally. That's really taking your life into your own hands. So I wanted to ask you what, what makes someone well-trained? What goes into training? How do you learn this stuff since there is no residency in aesthetic medicine? Even our dermatology and plastic surgery friends really don't do this non-invasive aesthetics in residency. Most of them don't. There are some residencies that have a little bit, but most of those years of, there's three years of dermatology if you become a dermatologist. There's seven years of plastic surgery if you become a plastic surgeon. And most of that is specializing in medicine, medical derm, plastic surgery, doing surgery. So what constitutes aesthetic training and how much experience do you need to get good? I think that is a loaded question as to how much experience, because I have been doing this 16 years and I just went last year over to Europe and trained with a uh, physician over there. So I don't think we're ever completely trained. I think that it's an ongoing training process in saying that in the beginning. Totally agree. <laughs> I mean, hours and hours and dollars and dollars spent on training. So I don't think there's something that like you get a blessing. If you've done 10 hours, you can go do this. What I find, especially with my training academy, is I find people will reach out to me. 
and they'll say, okay, how much is it? And actually I'm pretty, pretty reasonably priced. It's one-on-one -on -one training. And I spend two days, we're doing filler, two days with them. We do a minimum of eight patients hands-on. And it's funny because they don't want to spend the money. And this is doctors, this is nurses, this is whoever. Oh, it's kind of pricey. And I'm thinking, I don't think you can put a price tag on comfort level. So to answer the question, I think you have to feel, and not a cowboy, because I, I don't want you to think, oh, I'm the best. I can do this. You have to be, you have to be true to yourself and true to your own comfort level. And if you feel like you've had, again, hours of training and you feel comfortable in, in doing injections, then you're, you're trained. But it doesn't stop there. It continues and continues and continues. Yeah. Whether I, it's watching videos, whether it's going to other doctors' places or other providers, whether it's reaching out to the the companies, the companies have training for you. I couldn't get enough in the beginning. I could not get enough. Yeah, I felt the same way. I went to every single thing I could get my hands on. And and I so people should know there's such a variability in how people learn how to do this stuff because there are big courses that are put on by various organizations, some of which are run by doctors, some of which are literally run by non-medical people. When I was yeah. first looking into training, but this was back in 2013, I think, there were courses literally where a guy got, gets up, but one of my colleagues went to one of these and a guy gets up and starts lecturing about Botox, doesn't pronounce any of the medical terms properly. And so she Googled him and he was like an accountant. Oh, goodness who gracious. Wasn't even medical. And she realized this is bogus and she walked out. I went to one that was run by doctors. It was for doctors only. So I, I felt very comfortable with that. But it just gets you started. But then right. there are these weekend courses I learned about. There's one in Texas that actually is run by a guy who's a lawyer who realized there's a lot of money to be made and they right. will literally train anybody over a weekend. Doesn't You don't have to be a nurse. You don't have to have any medical knowledge. They train you over the weekend and they say, we'll find you a medical director. And they promise them they'll have now a marketable skill and make lots of money with a medical director if they do this weekend course. Can you imagine subjecting your face or any part of your body to somebody who's non-medical who took a weekend course? Right. It sounds insane to me. But, it does, but people do it. People do I, it. I, I and, know. And again, it's very dangerous. And just because it's cheap doesn't mean that it makes any sense to do that. I think it's right. crazy. Right. I, I think there'll always be people who will go for that option, even knowing that it's risky. But I think most people, if they knew that that was that common and that you could walk into a spa and that it could be completely illegal and the people there injecting you could be uh, injecting contaminated junk from China, that I, I have a one case that I've talked about on this podcast where this girl in California went to a place like that and was injected all over her body with fake Kybella that was contaminated with mycobacterium. Oh my and goodness. And she goodness. almost died. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And, oh my goodness. And the thing is people don't know, right? That they're no. walking into a place that, that could be operating in, in that scary right. way. Right. Something I'm finding like these, and, and like you said, there's so many companies out there doing it and some are pretty big name companies and I bet I've had at least three people who have come to me who were trained by them and they're trained completely wrong. So back in 2008, when I originally trained, we all did nasal labial folds because that's all that we knew. That's how you were trained. And that's one of the most dangerous areas. I yeah. rarely ever inject. Once the Luma came out, I rarely have ever injected a nasal labial fold. You're always mm -hmm. working mid face and, and lifting. But they are still, we, ha, we, I mean, I'm 16 years in and, and I'm hearing these people are being trained to immediately to go that. directly to the nasal labia. So one of right. the gals and that I, I trained, I said, okay, stop that. That's not happening. We're never doing this again. You've got to do mid face and cheek. <laughs> and it's just, it's scary to me that these are, this was a big company. This is one that people talk about all the time and they're still, they're not meaning even, a, a 
big company. Training um, company. Oh, a training company. Okay. A big training so for, company. For our listeners, the smile lines, so the, the lines that go from your nose down past the corner of your mouth, those are nasolabial folds. And in the very, very beginning, people injected those to smooth that line out. And most people don't do much of that anymore. Instead, we put filler in the cheeks to fill out volume that's lost in the cheeks. And once you do that, then that improves the look of the nasolabial fold. And you could maybe put the teeniest little bit in there, but you would never just load up the nasolabial fold. It just looks ridiculous. You kind of look like a chipmunk. Yes. And so, and so that's, what, that's what Dr. Jakes is talking about here is just the approach is essentially antiquated. That's what you're saying, right? Yeah. The, the level of, of education and training is very variable. I think that just because somebody is a doctor doesn't mean that they know what they're doing. They could be brand new. But I do think doctors know the risks more than people who don't have as much experience, haven't studied facial anatomy the way we have. When we think about it's our license on the line, if one of our people, let's say one of my PAs or my nurse practitioner, if they have a complication, it's my license on the line. Right. So I need to know that these people know what they're doing. They're really, really awesome. They have a ton of experience. If you're a nurse or if you're an esthetician and it's not your license on the line and you don't know the risk so well and you didn't sit down and study facial anatomy in anatomy class, you don't know what you don't know, and you don't know that you're having these risks. And honestly, it's not your license, and it's also not your malpractice that is on the mm -hmm. line. It's whoever's supervising you. So right. we take exactly. it very, very seriously. Yes. And I love the point that you made that it doesn't mean that all doctors are great, because over the years, all the trainings that I've done, I've actually taken a syringe out of a plastic surgeon's hand and said, you should not be injecting. And he wasn't real happy with me, but it's it's the truth. He just was too aggressive. He, he just wasn't good. So I always say I know within five minutes if somebody is going to be a good injector or not. And it does not matter what their initials are at the end of their name. It matters right. if you have the artistic ability, if you have, like you said, your anatomy, what to expect. You can see it. So I, I think there's so many more things than just getting a training. I think you have to have this innate ability, this artistic ab ability, I truly believe, to be a really good provider. Yeah. And I think that, you know, anyone who is dedicated to their own training, their own learning, has done this over and over, has done it for years, goes to every training they can. I don't care whether they have an RN or an NP, or a PA, or an MD, if you do it all day, every day, you're going to get better and better and better at this thing. And yes. I do think it's kind of interesting, your story about your plastic surgeon, because most plastic surgeons are busy doing surgery all the time. Right. They don't tend to be injectors, right? right? They have a very lucrative job by doing plastic surgery. And so plastic surgeons do tend to ha hire other injectors to work either under them or alongside them to do that part of the practice. Yes. And I'm not saying that plastic surgeons can't be fantastic injectors. There are some amazing ones out there for sure, but it's just Absolutely. not that common. Most of them right. don't do that. Right. And, and as you said, I mean, they should be doing their plastic surgery because that's what they were trained to do and they're good at it. But I do, I do, there are some plastic surgery clinics that they just inject. So, and they're doing very yeah. well, but I think the point that you made just a second ago about day in and day out aesthetics is extremely important. This isn't a side gig. So let's go back to right. choosing a provider. And right. one of the things that you should look for is that, is this their job? Is this what they do? Are they dedicated to this? Because so many, and I see it with physicians a lot, so many physicians do this as a side gig and they think they're going to make yeah. a ton of money doing it. And that's not the case. You have to be dedicated in I my think, opinion. Yeah. And I, I totally agree. I mean, we all had to start out somehow, right? Yes. Please. And and I would say I did this as a side gig for, for a pretty short period of time, but it was, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 months before I just was 
wholly in it. But if somebody's just kind of experimenting with it, doing it on the side, or even just a lot of times there are nurses who are doing that as well. And that's probably not legal <laughs> because if they, they're not working under a doctor, they, that's not really legal. But, but doing it all day, every day, no matter who you are, you get really, really, really good at it. Yes. And you also know all the risks and you're prepared for, God forbid, you have an occlusion, you've figured that out, you have all the Hylinex in the fridge. We do kind of little practice codes where we like go over the latest protocols. We tend to do that about once a year in my spa to make sure we're all on the same page. So I feel like that's really important. If you go to somebody who's just doing it on the side, they probably don't have Besides the experience, all of that stuff set up as well. I think um, that's a great idea is to do the, do the, the faux. <laughs> yeah. You know, like a little everything. code white. Right. Right. <laughs> Cause there's, I heard so, someone call it code Blanche, which code I thought Blanche, was cute. I love it. I actually, I sat down with Dr. Weiner back at the AMWC Miami and, and we were talking about this and he said, I'm not worried because I'm prepared and I know how to fix it. That's the thing is that if you practice it, even though you haven't had it, and you're prepared for it, yeah. you absolutely will be just fine. You know, yeah. and I, in my in my spa, we've had one person who we've treated for an occlusion. We did not cause that, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. But it was a woman who I've mentioned before. She bought a hyaluron pen online and and injected herself and gave herself oh, a vascular goodness. occlusion. And she walked into my office on a Saturday, and my nurse practitioner was there. And she's, oh my God, she freaked out. She's, oh my God, we have to treat this right away. She started treating it. She called me. I came in. We treated her for about three hours, got her perfusion back. She was okay. And my nurse practitioner, I kind of had to talk her down off the ledge, right? She's, oh my God, that was so scary, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, look, you were just handed a gift because you got practice treating yeah. this you know, dreaded complication, but you did not cause it. So, but you got practice treating it and you were successful and you helped save this lady's nose and her skin. And now you have one under your belt that you wouldn't have had otherwise. And thankfully it wasn't you who caused it. That, that I think is sort of priceless experience. Absolutely. So, you know, Absolutely. for every, for every possible thing that goes wrong, as much as we don't want to see it, then at least we have experience on how to deal with that. Right. So and you um, mentioned you mentioned nose and I want to I want to go there. I feel like so many people when they come in to do a training with me, they're like, hey, I want to learn how to do noses and labella <laughs> and this. And I just flat out say to them, don't, don't like, what are you yeah, thinking? Don't do it. Don't do yeah. it. It's not worth it. I personally don't do it because I like to sleep at night and the older I get. Right. And I don't either for the exact same reason. So for everyone listening, we do not do filler in certain places because it's so dangerous. Yes. So we don't do noses because the blood supply to the nose is very tenuous and it is really, really easy to get a vascular occlusion in the nose and need, and, and it won't be fixable necessarily. And so that, and then glabella, which are the, the 11s, the two lines between your eyebrows, there's a very high risk of blindness from that. I actually don't do temples either because I don't want to go anywhere near the temporal artery. Same. I will put sculpture in temples, but I will Same. not do filler in temples. And yeah, so you're, so, and I, sound, I think sound that, like we inject very similarly and are very yes. cautious. Yes. And I, I tell patients like there is no, so we come from real medicine where there was real risk. People were dying of breast cancer in my previous job. I, I, I don't miss breast cancer, I'll tell you. But in aesthetics, it's all elective and there's nothing is worth any permanent harm. So is, is blindness a reasonable risk? No, it's not. No. So is there anything else you'd like to leave our listeners with? I know that we've covered kind of a lot and we've harped on some of our similar themes that we're both passionate about. I think that aesthetics is such an amazing industry. And I think that everybody should do some kind of, whether it's treatment or just products or, or whatever to take care of themselves, because in the end, it's all about building confidence. And so when you decide that it's time to 
perk yourself up, lift your spirits. Just please make sure that you're doing your due diligence and checking the provider to make sure that they have the background, the skills, the knowledge to treat you and treat you appropriately. So I think that's what the whole purpose of this is, is, is to, to help people decide who is the right provider for them. And not to throw my book back out there again, but there is a whole chapter dedicated to finding the right provider. So if you are interested in learning more about Dr. Jacob's book or choosing a provider, we'll have links for you in the show notes. Thank you so much for being here today. I so appreciate your being on the podcast. Maybe you oh can gosh. come back again sometime in the Thank future. Thank you. Yes. I, I love education. I, that's why I started my own training academy, but I just absolutely love talking to other providers. And we're, it's funny because we really didn't know each other and we are completely on the same page with how we run our practice. And, and you mentioned something earlier about how we're all in this together. And I think the best thing that we can do as providers is uh, lift each other up and help each other out. And so I'm thrilled to be able to have these conversations and help people make a decision on who the right provider is for them. So thank you. Well, thank you so much for being here. It's been fantastic talking with you. Good. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. If you've learned something and like what we're doing, please tell your friends and give us a five-star rating in your podcast app. If you have a question or a crazy story of your own you'd like to share, please send an email or voice recording to info at drkatede.com. That's D-R-K-A-T-E-D-E-E.com. Or reach us through the website, medspamayhem.com. And read the book. Med Spa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Thanks for listening. This has been Med Spa Mayhem with Dr. Kate D. We are so grateful you're listening, and we hope you've learned at least one fun or possibly disturbing fact today. Don't forget to hit subscribe on your podcast app and leave us a five-star review. And read the book. Med Spa Mayhem is available everywhere books are sold. Links and more can be found in the show notes and on medspamayhem.com. Medspa Mayhem.